Okay, looks like we have reached time. All right, it's, it's 12.01. Uh, we better get to it, everybody. All right, well, good afternoon uh, and welcome to the Iowa City Foreign Relations Council's program with guest speakers, Dr. Ann Keach, Vin Nguyen, Mallory Petsch, and Rocio Lopez. Thanks to each of them and to everyone who has joined us online today. I am Peter Gerlach, Project Director for our program series, Refugees and Immigrants in Iowa, a uh, member of the ICFRC's board, and I am your host for today's program. We are grateful to the Humanities uh, Iowa and the National Endowment for the Humanities for their funding support for this project. We would also like to acknowledge and thank uh, our other annual donors, sponsors, and partners for their support, the Iowa Arts Council through the Iowa Department of Cultural Affairs, the University of Iowa's International Programs, Honors Program, Public Policy Center, and Center for Human Rights. The Stanley UI Foundation Support Organization, Midwest One Bank, and City Channel 4, and the UI Library Archives. ICFRC has adopted the Native American land acknowledgement prepared for the City of Iowa City's Ad Hoc Truth and Reconciliation Commission and Human Rights Commission. We recognize that our home community of Iowa City, quote, now occupies the homelands of Native American nations to whom we owe our commitment and dedication. The full text of our acknowledgement is on our website at icfrc.org. Okay, as we get started, I uh, would like to cover some Zoom etiquette tips. Uh, this is the time to make sure you know where your video button is located. Please uh, keep your uh, video turned off, if you would, for the presentation. Uh, and your audio has been uh, disabled so that uh, you don't interrupt the speakers during their remarks. Following our speakers' presentations at about 1.15 p.m. We'll have about a 15-minute Q&A, and you'll be able to submit your questions via the chat function. So get ready to use those typing fingers. At that time, we invite you to turn on your video, but you'll continue to be uh, muted in audio to avoid any background noise. It is now my pleasure to introduce our speakers who will talk today about area refugees and immigrants in search of higher education. Dr. Ann Keach is adjunct assistant professor in the Global Health Studies Program at the University of Iowa and an adjunct instructor of, in English language acquisition at Kirkwood Community College. Her teaching interests include education, immigrant and refugee health, and the connection between migration, diversity, and pandemics on both the physical and mental health of populations. Life experiences living in Kenya and the U.S. have informed her teaching. She teaches courses such as health experiences of immigrants, migrants, and refugees, pandemics and mental health, and mental health in diverse societies. She is the chair of the African Communities Network of Iowa and will be the diversity co-chair of the American Association of University Women in Lynn and Johnson County starting this July 1st. Vin Nguyen recently retired from Des Moines Public Schools after 34 years of service. He is now Refugee Education Coordinator at Lutheran Services in Iowa. Nguyen earned a secondary math teaching certification from Drake University in 1993, an ELL certification from William Penn University in 2006, and a master's degree in school leadership and supervision from Viterbo University in 2015. As a former refugee, one of the boat people from Vietnam, he found many difficulties and challenges in adjusting to his new life in 1980s America. With no English language skills, he struggled to communicate and often relied on others to interpret and to, find, to help find jobs. He has received many prestigious awards and recognitions, including Passport to Prosperity Award from the Iowa Council for International Understanding in 2004, 
the Dan Chavez Beyond the Horizon Award in 2005, which is given to an individual who demonstrates extraordinary effort on behalf of immigrant, refugee, and non-English speaking populations in Iowa, as well as the Impact Award from the Iowa Asian Alliance in 2022 from the Iowa Asian Alliance. His other awards are listed in his bio on our website. He is very active in Des Moines language minority communities and currently serves as the president of the Vietnamese American community in Iowa. He serves as a storyteller, speaker, and consultant on topics related to Vietnam, Southeast Asia, refugee and immigrant issues, the refugee resettlement process, and second language acquisition. Mallory Pesch has served alongside refugee and immigrant communities in Iowa for nearly a decade. Her work centers around building innovative cross-sector partnerships that eliminate barriers for newcomer communities and create space for strategic community-based solutions in education from pre-K to higher ed. Mallory currently serves as the director of Kirkwood Community College TRIO Student Support Services ESL program. The program provides culturally specific academic support, social engagement, and career planning for first and second generation immigrant students who are the first in their families to attend college are low income or have a documented disability. And Rocio Lopez is a sophomore at Kirkwood Community College studying sociology. Born and raised in Los Angeles, California, she is now living in Coralville, Iowa. As a work-study student for the college's TRIO program, Rocio works alongside other TRIO students to make connections and spread information about the program and what resources are available. She plans to transfer to the University of Iowa and pursue a career involving student support services. How wonderful. Uh, welcome to the, the four of you. It is fabulous to see you, fabulous to have you here. Uh, I am I'm ready to get into a great conversation. Uh, before I do that, I would like to put these into the chat and I hope everyone here uh, can take a little bit of time to, uh, to take a look at these three sources. The first is of course the I ICFRC's link for this series, Refugees and Immigrants in Iowa. The second is a fabulous article written by Paris Barraza in the, uh, in the Iowa City Press Citizen about our very topic today. And the third is the much esteemed dissertation by one of our, uh, one of our panelists today, uh, Anne Keach. Uh, it is titled The Educational and Occupational Aspirations of Sudanese Refugee Youth in American Public High School in the Midwest. Please check those out if you, uh, if you have some time. Uh, save the links for yourself and check them out later. Right now though, let us turn to our panelists and our conversation. Okay, I would like to begin today as I, as I have uh, all, of our, all of our programs in this series. And that is uh, to ask you, would you each share your migration story to Iowa? I mean, what's not in your bios, of course. Uh, and uh, as our student representative, Rocio, let me start with you. What is your migration story to Iowa? Would you share with us? Still having a, a mute issue, an audio issue? Okay, while Catherine is helping sort that out, uh, Mallory, may I turn to you? Sure. I am a lifelong resident of Iowa. I was born and raised in the Des Moines area and have spent time in the Waterloo area. And I'm now um, recently in this last year have relocated to Iowa City. So I will be speaking from that perspective as someone um, who's from Iowa and in the, the role of a service pro provider working alongside newcomer communities. Fabulous, thank you, Mallory. Uh, Anne? Uh, your migration story to the great state of Iowa? I came to Iowa to originally to join my husband who was a student at the University of Iowa. And with time, I decided to go to school at the University of Iowa and here I am. Uh-huh, fabulous, okay. And we're, we're all the richer for it. Uh, Vin, to you. 
Well, I, prob I am probably the furthest one. Um, I actually migrated from Vietnam. Um, as you all know, the Vietnam War, uh, the fall of Saigon, which is uh, in April uh, 30th, 1975. Uh, we have about a month to, uh, to um, uh, remembrance for the 47 years of the fall of Saigon. So after the fall of Saigon, um, we, our family stay and put in Vietnam because my mom and dad have 10 of us. You know, to get 10 of us to move anywhere is a quite a, uh, an ordeal for, for them. So they decided to stay put in Saigon. So we live under the new regime, which is a communist system for a um, number of years until the 80s. Uh, my parents decided to, um, smuggle me out of Vietnam. Um, so that's why the name of the boat people were given to us that who have been smuggled out from Vietnam or escaped from Vietnam by boat. So I was along with about 134 people uh, venture out to the open sea uh, one early morning um, uh, to, 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 to look for freedom and look for new opportunities. Um, and as you already knew, if you read or you research or you learn about boat people, only one out of two of us actually survive. So I am a, a lucky one. I'm the odd one to survive. Uh, 135 of us at the end, we have 10, 133 left. One got killed and one got kidnapped. We went through five different times um, to be robbed, raped, pirated, uh, torture, uh, harass um, by pirates or the fishermen in the local area. Uh, so we survived, 133 of us. We uh, got to Thailand. We got, got put in the camp, uh, got processed by UNHCR, and then we were sent to Indonesia. Um, I decided to come to United States. Unfortunately, I didn't have any relative here. Uh, in the state yet at the time. Um, so I was the free cases at the time, one of those. So luckily the Catholic charity here in Des Moines, which I owe my life to them, they have reached out and got my case to Des Moines. So that's why I came to Des Moines, called Des Moines home and have lived in Des Moines, you know, besides schooling up in Ames and back to here, I have been living here for the last 38 years or so. Um, so Des Moines is my home, my work, my um, everything. Thank you very much, Vin, for sharing that story. Yes, uh, and, and your story is in many ways has, has a very particular and important roots to the administration of Governor Ray, uh, who many folks here uh, may know his story and his welcoming of refugees uh, who were displaced by the Vietnam War. Um, thank you so much for sharing your story. Thank you. Rocio, how are we doing with that audio? Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can hear Perfect. you. All right. Okay. <laughs> Would you share with us your migration story to Iowa? Yeah. So, um, being a first generation college student, but also being a second generation um, um, Latina. Um, I was actually born and raised in Los Angeles, California. Um, however, before that, um, my dad had arrived to California well over maybe 20 years ago. And so um, it all started from there. Um, he grew up, he obviously, he spent his whole life here in the States. And so, um, he, he had a family, he had my siblings and I. And um, from there, um, COVID, COVID happened. COVID, uh, I will say COVID quote unquote ruined everything for my family financially. Um, my dad lost his job. Um, we depended on my sister's income, which was probably less than half of what my dad was making. And so that's when we turned to Iowa. We, uh, we looked at options. And so basically my parents looked at options. And uh, since we had close family relatives here in Iowa, uh, they really, um, Iowa stood out to us because of the opportunities they were describing to us. Um, my cousins from here and I'm super grateful for them. 
but um, the opportunities that Iowa was offering, um, a nonprofit organization that they were a part of, how, uh, how it helped them recover from when they moved here as well. And so we moved to Iowa, basically we packed up our whole life and we moved to Iowa and that's how I'm here. Um, I believe it's been a year and some months and um, I'm happy to say that um, we love where we are now. We love Iowa, we truly do. And it has brought so many opportunities to us. And so I believe the, 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 the proper, appropriate term it, uh, for my dad's, um, I think it's gonna be a second migration. I think that's the appropriate term to use. And so um, I would say that would be my migration story to Iowa, um, COVID reasons. And because we thought that there was gonna be more opportunities here than there was being offered in California. So, yeah. Well, thank you very much, Rocio, for sharing your story and your, and your father's story too. Yes, I mean we are all very much connected to our to our parents, to our roots, right? Uh, which, in so many cases, is quite global. Uh, and and you know, you've all once again demonstrated the importance of of this question, right? And and why I like to begin with it because. Every person's story matters, and learning about people um, reinforces all of our need to see one another and hear one another. Our, our, our stories are important. And so today, talking about education, right? Rosa, you, you pointed out exactly, you know, educational opportunity, and as your dissertation has, has made clear also to occupational uh, opportunities are, are really tied together. And understanding people's stories helps us understand where those opportunities may be. Um, thank you to each of you. Um, so as in uh, previous uh, programs in this, uh, this series, um, uh, we wanna locate uh, our context. Um, so, and part of how we do that, the need to do that, is also to recognize uh, people who are experiencing life uh, in different ways. Those who are refugees, immigrants, asylees, documented, undocumented, who have familial or friendship ties in the area, and those who do not, are quite different. <clears throat> it is important to make distinctions between different kinds of folks where they are coming from and what their circumstances are. Uh, we don't want to, uh, to, to cast anybody in too wide a group. So with this in mind, uh, before I get into my first question, I'd like to read a portion of today's session description, which I hope you've all seen previously, because I think it will help locate us in our conversation. Across the globe and here in Iowa, education is seen as a ticket to a better future. The knowledge one acquires and the credentials a degree confers have the power to open previously closed doors and lead to opportunities previously not possible. For refugees and immigrants navigating the complex systems of higher education in the US are overwhelming and promising too. In some ways, the realities are akin to most first generation families uh, there may be a steep learning curve about school types and the similarities and differences between them, about the FAFSA applications and costs for each school, about existing scholarships and other funding sources, and about the resources available to students new to the tertiary landscape. In other ways, there are realities which are unique to first-generation families newer to the U.S. For example, comparisons are made to higher education systems in home countries. Mostly, uh, English-only information makes reading about and understanding the many college options and their requirements challenging, and once enrolled, lines might be blurred between home and school life. Attending all first-gen students are aspirations and pressures both intrinsic and those from the hopes and expectations of not just their parents, but of the larger communities from which they hail. So with this in mind, um, 
I'm hoping, uh, and maybe uh, let's begin with, with Vin. Would you describe for us what you've seen with families navigating the complex systems of, uh, of education in the U.S. leading to higher education? There are financial aspects, academic, language, cultural, and intercultural, intergenerational, right? Uh, what are the most pressing concerns that you've seen then? Well, Peter, indeed, exactly what you were sharing, you know, when, when you have refugees, uh, an immigrant and asylum, every single group has uh, its own characteristic. And then when you talk about the refugee population, that's a variety of them come to uh, US with a different reasons, even though they are refugees, but, but their, their background information is quite important. We have refugee come into to our system, K-12 system without no literacy, no literacy in English and no literacy in their first language. So that's a huge challenge and barrier for them to access any information uh, to higher education. And then you have refugee coming in with some background in education, but no skill in English. So they have to start from zero on. And then you have people coming ready with some English and some background information. So the status of them before coming to the, to the US as refugees are very important. And they are the factor really uh, measure they're successful in higher education or not. And our system, to be honest with you, in K-12, at up to this point with so many years that I spent in K-12 education, uh, we have been doing a very good job, but not good enough. Not good enough to support the immigrant and refugee education in terms of help them to, what is the next step for them after high school? We have not done a good job of that. We are not able to give the access to our immigrant population, uh, which here in Iowa mostly Spanish speaking. With, with, with that, you know, we, we look at some school district, you have 25, uh, some small school district in Iowa have almost 50% of our Latino population, but access to, to higher education is still very lim limited. The sense of awareness to help our parents to know how to access the information and learn about opportunity for higher education, either community college or, or four-year college or, or even vocational school. They are limited. They are not translated. They are not uh, interpreted. They are not any shape or form that inform our parents about their choices and their opportunity. Like you mentioned before, FAFSA is only done in English. Lucky enough, we have some translation in Spanish. You know, we couldn't afford to go further with different ethnic group and language group that we have. As we all have to remember, all of these students should have access to higher education, but they don't have the access to the language they need for their parents. We have more than 100, 100 languages spoken every day in public school here in Iowa. But how many languages got translated and interpreted. We have to question that. And what do we do with them when they want to ask questions? We don't have the interpreter or translator to support our parent. Needless to say, even English speaker, you are native speaker to navigate the system for higher education is quite a, uh, is quite a challenge in audio already. So now you put step and step, onto their, their work. So many times parents would say, okay, I just pray that you go to college, whatever college that is. You know, um, the FAPSA process, they don't understand what it is. They just rely on their own children to make that, that important decision for themselves. Uh, and and, and parents very much have very little input into it because they don't understand the process. They don't understand the process that we have to navigate. You know, the FAFSA, the incomes, and all the things that they have to put together. Parents don't understand these things. You know, how to select a college that appropriate to their, their financial support or anything else. So, so the lack of, 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 of service that we currently have 
have put the effort of our uh, uh, immigrants and public, uh, refugee population in, in K-12 system 10 steps uh, behind in terms of, of, of uh, advancing themselves to a career or, or higher education. Um, so many of them, you know, I, um, I, I have a very bad habit to tell you that I, when I go to grocery store, when I run into a student in K-12, my question to them is, what are you gonna do after you graduate? And many of them said to me, we don't have the money to go to school and we don't have enough English to go to school. So that's the conception that we have out there, that people think that, that, that they need tons of money. They don't, they don't want to owe any student loan or, or whatever that is. They don't understand the FAFSA process. Secondly, they worry about their English language skill. Up in university or, or community college like Kirkwood or DMAX or University of Iowa, Iowa you still, you, you, you have the ESL classes. But here is the core issues. How do we prepare our students, either immigrant or refugees or any student at K-12? That is the most important especially in high school, how are we gonna give them that foundation so they can really build, so they can go to college, right? So, so that's the key, you know, for English learning, one hour a day is not enough, especially in high school. You know, you, you, you have one hour for ESL, and you act, actually think that they are able to, to function, Yes, they may have the oral language skill, but remember to access higher education or so vocational career, their language skill need more than just speaking skill and listening skill. They must know how to read, to write, to understand and comprehend what they read. And that's what I think it's, 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 uh, it, it's, it's right now, I, I, I don't, believe in K-12 here in the state that we have prepared them for that. And, and of course, like I said earlier, it's so many factor into to the student that we, we have. So therefore the counselor in K-12 system must know their student. They have to understand that student background so they can guide them appropriately, individually, because they have their own story, like you said, Peter. Each of them have their own story. Yeah. So much of what you're saying, Ben, uh, resonates with me. There's so much to say here, but you're, you, you, you nail it exactly. I mean, there's so many layers of privilege here, um, which either grant or deny access on so many levels, like you're describing. And does this match up with uh, with what you're seeing? Uh, is it is it consistent with perhaps what you found in your dissertation on Sudanese students in our state? Um, you know, what do you think about what what Vin has just shared with us? He's he's right. I I can some some of the things that he's saying under awareness, being aware of what's going on within the community. Uh, he talked about uh, FAFSA. Yeah, many parents are not aware, they are aware that there is FAFSA because the students come home with that information. But what they don't know how to do is fill the FAFSA, just like he has mentioned. So the question is, are they aware of uh, where they can go and seek that help? That's a question. If the students are bringing home the information, don't they also need to bring home um, maybe ways so through which the parents can uh, use that information to help the students fill the FAFSA. So th there are a lot of questions that come into play. Uh, you're giving me information and I'm aware, I may be aware that there is this information here, but if I know, I'm not able to utilize that information because I don't know how. So awareness should also include, um, if I know exactly um, what the information is, then I believe that I should also know how to utilize the information that you're giving me. 
handing me information and telling me this is going to be useful when you're applying for a particular thing and you're not uh, informing me about other things that I need to know in order to complete that information, then the information you're giving me is not worth giving to me. So I think that's part of um, uh, some of the things that I've seen with the, with the immigrant communities. They are given information about a particular thing, but it is just information. They need another step added to that information so that they can know how to utilize the information that they've been given. So I can look at it and say, I need to be aware of it. And in that first part where awareness comes into play, I also need to feel comfortable enough to ask questions about um, the information that you're giving me. And once you have given me, I feel comfortable in asking questions about the information you're giving me, then I will be able to utilize it. So there are sort of three steps. I'm aware of the information, then do I feel comfortable with the information you're giving me? Yes, if I'm feeling comfortable with the information you're giving me, then I will utilize it. But the, that part of it I see is missing in many of the, um, the information that we have in the community. Yeah, yeah great points, Ed. You're, you're so right. Um, I mean, I think back, um, you know, it's an unfair comparison, surely, but to you know, my own experience and feeling very overwhelmed by these college possibilities and grateful that my parents knew about them and knew what to do and could help me guide me through it. Knowing English, uh, you know, knowing uh, all these intricacies, having gone through college, my, my father was a, a professor, an immigrant himself, you know, knew the system well. Um, but that is that is far from the case, and you've been and and you've made very clear um, all of the complications. And and you're so right; it's it's not just access information to information. If folks can't even get that, um, there 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 are multiple steps to get through to to to, uh, to be successful to get to college, which says nothing right about success while in college. Indeed, yeah. Um, Mallory, uh, we're going to get to resources uh, and, and, and what services and supports are available uh, for students, but I'm wondering, you know, what is your response to, to, to Vin and, and to Anne? Are you seeing similar things at Kirkwood Community College? How do you understand the challenges that students and their families bring to you? Yeah, absolutely. I think that you know, we're seeing this in every community in Iowa, um, and it's awareness, but also access to resource and services. Uh, at Kirkwood Community College, the TRIO Student Support Services ESL grant that we're operating our program with um, from the Department of Education is one of only 13 in the country. And there is such um, a significant lack of resources for these types of programs and these types of support services. You know, and as um, and what we're really focusing on is supporting students as they're transitioning from their language learning courses into their content um, and level courses and their major programs. But the need goes so far beyond that. Um, things that I see are how much um, one individual's experiences are incredibly unique, and I'm glad that we highlighted that. And I want to keep that in mind. But something I do see is how tied an individual's migration story can be to what resources they are eligible for and have access to. You know, for example, needing to have um, what documentation you need to have to have access to the FAFSA, um, what socioeconomic status, how long you need to be in the country. These can all be contributing factors to what sorts of support programs, financial aid that students may have access to or may not have access to. We have a lot of students here living in Iowa City that came to the United States through the diversity visa lottery program. And through that program, you know, in order to gain access to that, they needed to demonstrate um, a higher education level. And so a lot of the students that I see and work with were um, so are incredibly highly educated people. They are doctors, they're lawyers, they're accountants, they're teachers, but unfortunately the system 
wasn't built to give them a path forward when they got here with that career. And there is no path for if you were educated um, as a doctor and moving here to Iowa City, how you enter back into that field, it's very complicated. And that's not, um, when you get here, there's no one that sits down and is walking you through that. You know, there's different sporadic programs, like the program we have at Kirkwood and many great community-based organizations and nonprofits that are supporting students and guiding them through it, but it's not like a systematic or community-wide um, resource or approach. Um, so that can be incredibly difficult for students, you know, getting back into careers or for individuals, like Vin was talking about that, um, came to the United States and have pre-literacy and are starting and learning English as their you know, first language. And their experiences with education is going to look a lot different than someone who had graduated from high school and um, is entering into college. So we really do see so much diversity in the students that are here at Kirkwood and just in general in Iowa and how they're act accessing and just what resources they do have access to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Rocio, from the student perspective, uh, and I'm also interested in the intergenerational dynamics that you touched on before when you when you shared your own story. Right. What What are you seeing? You know, what What is the reality like uh, for a student? Well, coming from um, immigrant parents, uh, I know we talked about that. Everyone touched a little bit on uh, FAFSA. I think that's like the one that I, I would probably say um, first generation students struggle a lot with. Um, having parents that probably didn't, um, well, my parents didn't finish, maybe I believe it was their elementary education. Back in Mexico, it's like, like I tell them, I need to complete FAFSA, like I need help. Well, they don't know what to do. And so like, it was tough. It was tough because I remember I had to sort of figure it out on my own in a way, in a sense, um, going into it, I, we were going I, I was going into it blindly so I feel like a lot of people can relate to that um I'm a peer mentor here at, at the trio uh, at Kirkwood and so I have peers that have talked to me about that as well like um they ask for certain documents that our parents don't have and so mm -hmm. there's really not um if it weren't for trio there, it, there really wouldn't be anyone who, to explain to me or to us that actually it's this that you have to put in and stuff like that. So I guess in a way that's how we have a hard time navigating through the system of higher education as well as um, English not being our first, my first language, that, that was not my first language. And so um, as well as many here, um, it's not their first language. And so that becomes difficult when looking at a very official like college applications or college documents it's like what does this mean like who can I go to I have no one to go to and if it's not that it's like I'm shy to talk to someone about this I'll feel ashamed that I don't know enough vocabulary to understand what to fill out and stuff like that so I think that's something that I've seen and but that I've experienced um from the student perspective um so. Yeah, that's what I would yeah, say about Rosia. that. Yeah, no, excellent points. Yeah, indeed. Then I'm getting the feeling that you, you've wanted to, to share something else. Am I right? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you know, you, you know, when we really get deep into the conversations, I, I'm going to be honest to all of us here. Personally, I feel we have an equity issues um, in our system. Even though, even though, you know, when you look at any school district, even our own school district, we have all kinds of statements. We have all kinds of things that we put it out on equity. But is it truly we have equity or not? That's, that's the big question. We have to question ourselves all the time. When, when I say this, does it really mean this? When I say, all students have access to higher education. What does it really mean to us when we say that? Do we give people the opportunity, but do we give them the tool to access the opportunity or not? It's just like you go out there and tell, hey, there's a lot of apple in that apple tree. 
but they are seven feet tall and we are only four feet tall. You can jump, you can do whatever you can, but you never ever reach one apple. That's what it feel like sometimes to me in our school system that we do have access. But only students who are refugee and immigrant have some support and the right support they get, they catch those. But what about the rest of them may not have that? You know, and many of them, you look at the drop out, you know, and talking about Sudanese. I have worked with Sudanese students and many of them end up in, in places that you don't want them to end up to because they don't have that access. They don't have that equity like we want to say or, or put it out there on, on the website because our parents don't have that, you know? So that's why I said, whenever we put statement out there, we gotta ask ourselves and among us, when you come up with that statement, how would you make sure when we say, what access do we give to our student population and their parent? And talk about sense of awareness. To me, that's not enough. It has to be the education. What kind of education that you give to parents so they understand? From that sense of awareness, connect with the education to make it happen for them, you know, so they can access whatever that we have opportunity for them. You know, not 100% of refugee and immigrant need to go to four year college, to be honest with you. You know, community school, vocational. Many of them are getting really making good money with vocational. I have one former student and he was struggling with four year college. He said, I told him go to DMAT, get your, your mechanic, you like to fix cars. Now he's a, he's a, a, a dealer. You know, he, he have <laughs> tons of people coming buy car from him. You know, so therefore it doesn't have to, but Equity, access, and sense of awareness. How are you going to make that happen? Yeah, yeah, I completely agree with you. And you know, I'm uh, I'm thinking a lot about the, some of the points that you that each of you have made. I'm struck, Mallory, by the fact that your your trio program, which focuses on ESL at, at Kirkwood, is one of thirteen in the country, and that gets me thinking. Um, you know. In many cases, being in college is almost too late. You know, the, the education, the understanding, the supports need to be there in, in greater supply in, before one gets to college to understand the landscape so that one can be successful in college, a greater number of folks can get into the college system. Um, you know, many of my colleagues in the state and around the country, we, we talk about this regularly, of the, the real significant challenges, uh, especially in that first year, and even more particularly in that, in that, in that first uh, semester that, that students are, are in college, and increasingly uh, minority students being in, in college. And I, I have to say, I mean, uh, I, I want us to, to talk a little bit about maybe what we're seeing from the vantage point of, of educators and of, of educators both in the classroom and, and those in the, in the uh, student affairs professionals. But I have to say, as both a researcher and as an instructor, uh, being in the faculty and staff side of the house, um, I have long been deeply uh, troubled by the ways in which non-majority students, so students of color, international students, uh, non-native English students, refugee and immigrant students have been cast in a deficit capacity. Given all the challenges that we're talking about, uh, these students are exceptional in many ways, truly exceptional and not in a deficit capacity. But I'm referring to the you know, problematic narratives which have real life manifestations and consequences. Uh, that these students are less intelligent, they're a burden, uh, they don't conform to educational traditions. Uh, just to name a few, beyond being offensive, which they are, these narratives, I believe, and I think it sounds to me like all of you definitely agree, they're false and they're short-sighted. 
as the student bodies at all of our institutions, University of Iowa, DMAC, you mentioned Kirkwood, as these schools grow more diverse, so too must institutional thinking and our practices, right? Okay, I have a lot more to say on this. This is a, this is a, a subject that touches home with me uh, being, being an educator, but that's for another time. What are you hearing about the, the, the challenges and the joys? Because okay, we've, we've spent time focusing on challenges, but the joys also. Uh, let's start with you know, uh, uh, professors, about teachers in the classroom uh, who teach refugees and immigrants, uh, inside and outside the ESL classroom. Um, maybe, Anne, could I start with you on this one? Your teaching, uh, you know, what is it you're seeing? Um, what I've seen and what I've heard some of the students come to me and talk to me about is that when they participate in the classrooms, um, the other students listen to what they say. And at one point or another, they hear talks like, if you don't like it so much here, why don't you go back to your own country? And so with that kind of talk going on, I actually asked one of my students, so the reason why uh, she was not participating in class. And she told me, why would I do that? Everyone else looks down upon me. And so if I participate in class, chances are they're going to say something that will stop me from saying what I truly want to say. And I, uh, let that student know that is this is an environment where we are allowed, allow yourself to speak, allow yourself to talk about what's bothering you. This is a place where we can discuss some of the issues that come, come up. And if there is anything that we need to talk about in the classroom, then we need to talk about it instead of you keeping quiet in class and not participating because you are afraid of what someone else is going to say when you say something. So that's one thing. The other thing that I've seen in, uh, for example, at Kirkwood is that when students are, um, when they come to the classroom, um, they tend to have their own ways of doing things. And one of those being, when they were in their own country, they were taught certain ways of, their education system was different. And so when they come to the classroom, they bring that with them. They don't leave that outside the door and then follow the American education system. No, they come into the classroom with that. And so the way they answer questions, when you ask them questions, or sometimes they may answer questions without raising their hand, or when somebody else is talking, they are talking at the same time. Things like that um, does not probably resonate well with others in the classroom. And instead of you know, giving them time to learn, giving them that space, that opportunity, or kind of learn how things are done in the United States, but then ask for their input. This is the way things are done in the United States. That's the first step. And usually during orientation, I think different schools tend to give that information to their student, but they never ask them, how do you do things in your own country? And can we meet you halfway? Or what can we do to make this experience better for you? We don't sit and ask those questions. What we do, we tell them, this is what we expect of you. This is what we want you to do. And the way we reason, is based on the American system of education. But we are ignoring the fact that some of these students coming in are grown up adults. And it's going to be difficult for them to just switch all of a sudden that, ooh, I'm in now in American class and these are the uh, things that I need to do here. It, it takes time for one to change to that. When it comes to students answering questions, or a test has been given. There are a lot of multiple choices that are given in American uh, when we set up exams. Some of these students are not exposed to multiple choice questions. So it becomes a challenge to them. How am I going to answer this question? The assumption from those who are teaching is I'm giving multiple choice and I expect the students to answer the questions. But 
if they have not been expo if they do if they do not have prior exposure to answering multiple questions multiple choice questions then it becomes a challenge to them so those are some of the issues that I've come across and I've had other people saying, why are they not doing well in this? It's because we are not meeting them halfway. What is it as, you know, as uh, professionals? What is it that we can we do for them? We need to be asking them questions. What would you like me to do to help you succeed in the classroom? I do realize when you take multiple choice questions, you don't do very well. What role can I play in helping you achieve the goals that you have set for yourself? So these are some of the things that are missing in our everyday discussion. But for somebody like me who comes from that kind of background and who was not, when I was going to the classroom, I had problems with multiple choice questions. I give them that chance because I know where I have been and where I'm going to and the kind of problems that I faced while I was going to school. So that gives me a little edge on how to handle these problems as they come along in my classrooms. You, you've nailed probably my, uh, my, primary, um, my primary difficulty, my primary criticism of, of higher education. Uh, in, in my career, uh, my, my research uh, teaching I have over and over heard the term adjust and adjustment. And my, my primary beef is that adjustment is too often unilateral and not bilateral. We expect that students, particularly non-majority students should adjust to the majority system, to the classroom expectations, to the way that professors want to do things without the institutions, the faculty members, fellow students, uh, student affairs professionals also adjusting to the students. There's no way that higher institutions, any in educational institution, uh, higher, uh, excuse me, high school can truly be successful with a increasingly diversifying group of students unless we're adjusting to each other. Um, we, we, we've talked about a lot of different things here. Mallory, I also want to turn to, uh, you know, folks who are working in, in roles like yours that are so crucial. Could you tell us uh, what, tell us a little bit more about the TRIO ESL program and what sorts of, uh, what sorts of supports and services uh, you provide? And maybe a bit too, and we'll turn to Rocio to sort of, uh, you know, shore up the answer about how students are, uh, are feeling about these services? Because they're pretty new to Kirkwood. What, what are you seeing there? Yeah, I'm really seeing how transformative this program is for our Kirkwood community. You know, our services is a lot of one-on-one -on -one support for students, a lot of mentorship, um, and having a diverse team who brings with them uh, skill sets that have varying languages, life experiences from different cultures and different communities to build a network of support for students. We have faculty that um, have released time from their departments to work with our program and provide tutoring services for students. So we're able to help work to bridge language gaps that students may have as they're um, because for a good example is we have a lot of students taking anatomy and physiology classes and they're not teaching that vocabulary in English language learning classes. And it's very likely that students wouldn't have had the opportunity to build the knowledge that their peers may have if they had experienced those classes in high school or in the conversations they have with others and having faculty who are specifically working with students who understand those needs um, has made a really big difference. But also with raising awareness around the college and building community with different departments, you know, with TRIO, we're collaborating with really every single department, every major program, because our students are in every program. 
And we've been able to do professional developments to have conversations with different departments about how can we make programs more accessible, you know, the strengths that our students bring and how can we be providing leadership opportunities, how can we be unlocking um, and opening doors for students that may be closed because of barriers that are possible to, to fix and to address, but might have not otherwise um, been highlighted or brought up. And it's working, you know, students that are in TRIO, we're seeing that they're having higher GPAs than their peers who are not in TRIO. We're seeing students are persisting, you know, and we are also seeing more students that are starting to graduate. Um, also something that we've started seeing is students who have stopped out and um, maybe started at Kirkwood and weren't successful the first time around, they're coming back. We're seeing a lot of students that are starting to return because the word's gotten out, they hear that the support service is here. And so they're coming back to give it another try. Um, we do a lot of different workshops for students focusing on like financial literacy, talking about um, different career opportunities and resources. And we partner with different um, governmental and nonprofit organizations. Uh, Iowa Works is someone that we work really close with. Uh, we also are doing transfer advising and helping bring students to different um, four-year schools and to talk about how can we make that a possibility for students that that's a goal that they have and or helping them access their career and technical programs. And then also looking at what comes next after Kirkwood, planning for the future, making sure that students have a plan and a path forward to be successful with their goals even after they leave our program. And so that it's been really amazing to see that, but also in this work I'm seeing how much it's needed other places. It's not uncommon for us to have students reach out from other schools or other communities that don't have these types of resources, but word gets out, you know, communities are small, they talk to each other, individuals talk to each other. And I just really hope to see these types of programs becoming more of the norm and to be started in different places because we know that they work and we know that they make a difference, but having the resources and support to do that is so essential. Mallory, it seems to me we need to clone you. Uh, what, <laughs> what you're describing is exactly what Vin was saying earlier, right? Of the kinds of programming and supports, uh, the, the, the culturally responsive uh, educating and informing that needs to happen not just at, at the higher ed level, but needs to happen in our school systems across the state. It, it's essential. And you, you noted specifically there that you're seeing gains, you're seeing successes amongst the students. And imagine, I mean, all of us, imagine if, if that were the case with younger students, how much more confident, how much more prepared, uh, how much more am ambitious in some ways, perhaps, students might feel and be. Rocio, uh, what's it like to be a, a TRIO ESL student and to be working with others and, and you know, helping create opportunities uh, at your institution? Oh my gosh, it's amazing. Like, um, like Mallory touched on, it's um, transformative, uh, def most definitely. Um, I entered TRIO when it was just starting. <laughs> I was one of the first, uh, one of the very few first uh, students that entered TRIO here in Kirkwood. And so I saw it from like where no one was here, like it was just me hanging out in the TRIO space to like so many different people now, like so many people come in, so many, so many languages being exchanged. Like, oh my God, it's amazing. Um, the workshops we offer, I actually held one as well. Um, it's, just amazing to see how people are actually wanting to learn. Um, doesn't really matter. Like if they don't understand, we'll help them understand. It's that type of thing. Um, also, we one of the ones that I I attended another. I guess you could say another culturally award aware academic support group that we have here is it called Conversation Club. Um, conversation club is where people go and practice the, the English language. They learn about the um, English, uh, the culture, and it's it's really nice. It's really nice to how to see it go from like maybe five people showing up to maybe like ten people showing up. It's really nice seeing that engagement of students because of the word getting out that um, 
they're not alone. There's, there's so many people that can relate to the same situation. And also, uh, Mallory touched base on leadership roles. I've seen that a lot. Um, like I said, I'm a, a peer mentor and with my team, we're a team of three. And so it's not just all of the same, I guess you could say a same race. It's, um, we're, we're different and it works because everyone has a different story, everyone contributes. And so it's really nice. And so translating when we have little flyers going out of the events we might have in TRIO, um, it works out because everyone, we have one that gets translated in French, we have one that gets translated in English, we have another one in Spanish. It's, it, it just, it's so nice having, having that as a student. Um, and so also things that TRIO offers would be like career services, um, those like little extensions that we have all over Kirkwood. Uh, that's, our, that's my job to do as a peer mentor. If anyone has a question, then that's my job to guide them towards that resource. So I would say that's something I see as a student in TRIO, yeah. Rocio, I'd like to do a quick thought experiment with you. Uh, we, we, can all, <laughs> we can all do it together through living vicariously through your answer. Um, okay. <laughs> I, I wonder, um, how do you imagine um, a, a TRIO ESL program, the kind that Mallory and you have just described, what would that be like in your high school? Oh, um, what would the impact be, really, is what I'm wondering. What, the, what would the impact be in your high school if such a program were there, like Vin was saying, is so important that we need? I'd probably say the higher rate into going uh, for going into college. I think the, the rates would go much higher than what I've seen. Um, probably, like, not even just college. Um, I'm a vocational school, I think that's what it's called, trade school, all that stuff. Um, I think that's what I would see, uh, the impact I would see if we had something like this in high school, especially, like, first-generation students they would uh we'd probably make workshops for their parents to come by and learn about FAFSA learn the terms of like the college world so I think I think that would be the impact I'd see for sure um I don't know if Mallory would <laughs> like to elaborate as well on that um yeah <laughs> yeah Mallory what would this look like and uh if it were replicated I mean one of 13 at uh, higher ed institutions in the United States, that number is egregiously low. Um, but, you know, what, what would this look like? In, how, how would you, maybe in just a few sentences, how would, how would it be adapted? And what would the impact look like uh, at the, the, you know, at the, the secondary level? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that it would be like incredibly transformative to see that. And we know that there is so much impact even before high school, even in the middle school, you know, when students are in, you know, that those core really essential times of their life and learning and supporting their parents and bringing more awareness, you know, the, the sooner you start, you know, it, it can really help you just getting off to the right foot in the right, right direction. You know, the good news is there definitely are programs that are doing great work. You know, there are, you know, other types of TRIO programs that are in the high schools. There are amazing nonprofits, and there also are a lot of teachers. But the key piece I think that this type of program brings is really that um, culturally specific services is bringing um, different language access and awareness to programming. And I think just also having individuals from the community being engaged as stakeholders, as staff, you know, as leaders that students can interact with, because so much of that is seeing someone who has a background similar to yourself, who's, who's done it, who's made that, who's made, you know, made it through, who's graduated, who's moved on, who can understand where you're coming from and seeing more diverse staff in our K-12 systems is, is essential and important in addition to bringing the resources, because you can have the best resources in the world, but if you don't have the team, if you, you're not connected to the community, you don't have that trust and that understanding, it's not gonna work. You're not gonna build those connections. You're not going to be able to reach and engage, you know, the students and the families that you're setting off to. And so I really hope to see, you know, that work continue to grow. I know there are a lot of great organizations who have already started and just getting them the resources that they need to continue that work and to grow these types of programs. 
Now, would you separately uh, afterwards, would you share with me some of those organizations that you know mm -hmm. of that are working in the secondary levels that are really doing a great job with this? I think it'd be great to highlight some of those. Uh, maybe we, through ICFRC, we can we can do some of that. That'd be great. Um, Vin, I've got a, a, another question for you. Uh, I know we're running out of time, but do you mind you know, briefly sharing with us how the pandemic uh, has impacted refugee and uh, immigrants' uh, educational attainment? I mean, this has been a hard time for everybody. Um, how has it been particularly so for refugee and immigrant students and their families? Yeah, I um, thank you for asking that question. The pandemic have done, you know, the COVID-19 had done a, a uh, tremendous uh, push backward for the refugee and immigrant communities, especially in the state. I mean, I, I know Department of Human uh, Rights have, you know, translation during COVID-19 or whatever that is, but but access uh, is almost like at the stalling, you know, because there's so much information during that COVID time from different things and, and our parent, our community just don't have the access to it. You know, when, when you have the information all in English, they, they may not be able to understand 100%. When any statement, if you don't un understand 100%, there's a chance and probability that you're going to be wrong uh, very highly. So therefore, it impact. I mean, it's just humongous things that we now have to recover. And, and to recover, that's why I, I'm, I'm going to be honest, when, when, when Mallory talking about the trio, for K-12 education, we need to start very young. Early on, I'm calling for parent educations. You know, I'm calling for that education that every school district in K-12 need to put in because out of 300 plus school district in Iowa, every school district have English language learner who are either immigrant or refugees. And, you know, especially the top 20 school district is about 80 or so percent of English language learner in there. So I'm calling for parent education and everything that they need to do. Um, because if they are able to put in a curriculum for parent education for immigrant and refugee parent, that would help us, would help the refugee student, would help the immigrant student um, to learn about opportunity early on. So you don't have to wait until high school. You don't have to wait until the senior year to begin to learn about FAFSA. That is way too late, you know? So our parents need to have that information very early on so they can navigate the system. You know, if they don't have the information, even they learn about something, but how are they navigating the system to get their children to be in places that they want them to be? You know, so I am calling for that parent education for immigrant and refugee parents in the school system. I echo you, Van, definitely. And that's on you attendees too. I wonder if we can't challenge our area school districts to do exactly what we're describing here. I mean, these are tangible ways, right? These, these programs, these services, getting uh, educated and trained the right kind of people, the Mallory's of the world in more places, starting from a, a younger age, so that we can enable and empower more students to have whatever uh, educational uh, experiences they wanna have, uh, 100%. Um, my, my last question, uh, before we turn to questions from the audience, uh, I'd like to ask, one more important thing, all over the state and indeed all over the country, of course, school campuses of all types are diversifying and at a rapid rate, right? How are colleges and universities more vibrant for everyone, <laughs> let's say particularly in learning spaces with the inclusion of the voices, the ideas and the contributions of students from all cultural and national backgrounds. 
Anne, I'd like to start with you um, in, in, in brief terms so that we can get to some Q&A. How is diversity good for our schools? I guess is the simple question, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that um, I'll give an example of Global Health Studies Program. Global Health Studies Program has given us opportunity to um, hear different voices. For example, I have my class, which is uh, which I'm currently teaching, Health of Immigrant, Migrant, and Refugees. I hear different points coming from different people in my classroom. I have a diverse group of people. And each person brings a different perspective into the discussion. I think that what one, like we've said right from the beginning, um, one, one's experience is different from the other one. We all have different experiences. And we, when we get into a classroom like the one I'm currently teaching, I have students coming from different uh, background. And when they are in the classroom, they all contribute to the discussions. And I think the discussions are really lively because of what we hear from, for example, somebody coming from Latin America, from Mexico. I hear discussions from somebody coming from African country. There are several African countries. And so I hear conversations from those uh, from different groups. I have students coming from uh, um, Korea. And, and so when they all get into discussion, the, you will hear different points of view. And together, the information that we have is much stronger because we are hearing this voice from here represented and that voice from here represented. And when we put all that information together, we can build the world. I think <laughs> that global health studies program does a great job by giving us this opportunity and allowing all these students to come into the classroom and contribute it that way. And as I hear them speak, um, well, as I hear different students speak, sometimes I'm just there to listen. It's, it's great to be provided with that opportunity and to have a classroom like that where I hear different voices. And that's all I can say about that. Because yeah, Amen. Great. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. I totally agree with you. Indeed. Uh, Rocio, uh, before we, we go to our audience, uh, you know, our schools, uh, our student populations are diversifying. Uh, your classmates, you know, are seeing the world in, in new and important ways. Uh, why is diversity in the school setting so important? What do you think? I would definitely agree with, to what Anna and said she took the mouth uh, she took the words right out of my mouth uh, we could create a, uh, an amazing world uh, through diversity um i've noticed that here in trio because i i work with so many so many people from so many places and i've noticed like so many amazing projects coming out of these interactions and so that and that's only from here in, in kirkwood so like in the outside world like i'm it, 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 it's just amazing what happens when like um, when you see diversity in, in school, especially because um, we learn new cultures, we share, we share our culture, we gain a new uh, sense of other cultures. It's just it's just amazing. And um, I know this is just like a quick um, snippet of what I get, but um, I work closely with the tutors, our professors here in TRIO. And so I just, sometimes I catch them learning a new language through their students. So that's really fascinating to me. Um, and, I, and I just love that, I, I love that a lot. And I forgot to mention that they also provide an opportunity where people can carry research. This is happening mm -hmm. in my country or this was happening in my country. How is it in your own country? So a lot of opportunity for that and the counseling. And it's an amazing world when you hear all these students coming to the classroom and talking about different things in their own voices. I think it's great. Jen, you're itching to say something and then I'm gonna turn to you and go for it. <laughs> you know, when Anne said all voices, I just wanted to put another challenge to make sure, especially in K-12 system, 
whenever they create any policies or any things that impact their families and their student population, they need to create that voice that parents can have input in, mm -hmm. not this the voice of the privilege. How you gonna be able to give access to our parents so they can voice some of the concern that they have? That's a critical. Because get we get to remember this. Some of our refugees, you know, <laughs> some of our, uh, our refugee population, their parents risk their life. They risk their life because of their children's future. And when they come here, we negate it. <coughs> we negate it by not giving them the access to the opportunity that we, we always boasted out there. You know, so, so how are we going to be able to, to do that? That's that's that quite you know I refer this back to Des Moines School because I I worked there for a number of years. We have more than sixty percent of our student color. Sixty percent plus. That's a humongous percentage for any school district have that many uh, student of color. You know, so very diverse, but not Des Moines alone. We have many school district shuts in Iowa. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> so okay. it's important, we, very important yes. for us to in K-12 before we're talking about higher education or so, uh, career right. or, or, or so on. I completely agree with you, you know. Okay, we now move to the Q&A portion of our program. Please submit your questions via the chat function at the bottom of your viewing screen. Feel free to turn on your video function. Uh, but we're going to keep your audio off. While we're waiting for questions to come in, ICFRC wants to thank its members and donors for their support to provide these free educational programs to our community, community across the state. If you would like to join ICFRC or make a gift to support this project, please go to icfrc.org. Thank you. Okay, so I, I'm really hoping we're gonna get some questions in that chat box there. Otherwise, man, I've got a lot of them. Okay, uh, yes. Um, let me go to the top here. Uh, TRIO programs, Amaru says, are absolutely great for historically marginalized populations. I just wish we had TRIO services hosted in community agencies and centers because many people do not know about them. Therefore, bringing the programs to the community is key to reaching those who need most. An excellent point, thank you, yes. Uh, Belinda, we are witnessing a refugee crisis with the war in Ukraine. In, indeed we are, you're right about that, millions. With refugees who have lost everything and need to rebuild their lives in a new environment, do we provide enough mental health support to refugees in our schools and communities? That's an excellent question. Uh, we, we only touched very lightly on, on mental health. Um, would somebody like to address that question? I would like to uh, address that question and my answer is no. Um, and, and, and if you understand the refugee process is have changed a bit in the last many years. Um, the refugee population, when they came to the United States, they have 90 days to be sufficient and efficient by themselves, 90 days. After 90 days, the resettlement agency that have uh, the one who brought them to, to, to US to resettle, they will have to release the responsibility for those friends. So after 90 days, they have no access to, to many things, but they have to be self-sufficient. So therefore, you know, I'm, 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 that's why my, my passion is to talk about the community and the passions and, and how are we gonna build bridges for these uh, families so they can be very successful in our society and become more productive. You know, the thing about when you are not able to give them the access in the beginning, how much you gonna have to pay for later on in terms mm -hmm. of social services, in terms of not mentioning some bad thing happens and you know, all those things that it, it's, it's going to pay for. Why aren't we doing it in the beginning to make sure that, that the family we brought over will be sustainable, will be 
self-sufficient in a very productive way. Right now, I am not seeing it, even though I work right here at LSI, some of our refugees from Afghan, Afghanistan coming in, they, they're gonna be done in a few days, for example. And then how are they gonna access all the things? You know, they don't have a car, they don't have the this and that, that that any regular Americans would have or any other immigrants that have privilege to have. So how are they gonna access all the things that we, we mentioned earlier? So the community must, we must band together to, to do some work to really support the new, new arrived refugees community. Now we're looking for work for the Ukraine too, when they come, we, we must have a system to put in place so they can be successful. We're just not gonna bring them over in, in 90 days, you go, you good to go. I, I just don't think that process has been done uh, enough. Yeah, 90 days is simply not enough. You're very right. Yeah. And in terms of mental health supports. Uh, and then mental health support okay. is nowhere to be compared because we don't yeah. have bilingual mental health caseworker. Right. We still do mental health through the interpreter. Mm -hmm. That's why our parents shy from receiving services because mm -hmm. many of our family come from the settings that they don't want to share that information to a stranger and the stranger said to somebody else so they can get help. Right. So we get bottlenecked in that services itself. We don't have enough mental health services in our school system in K-12 wider. You know, needless to say, to reach out to find a bilingual person who understand the culture, the language to provide that mental health services. I think we are in crisis. Um, and we need to do something to make sure that we produce, you know, that's why I, I hope some of the program we have in universities or in college talk about mental health, but train and recruit the bilingual student into the field so we, uh, we can have enough people to really give people the access to, to mental health services. Right yeah. now, I think it's a huge crisis right now for us, especially bilingual family. Thank you, Vin. Thank you. Uh, others want to address? A Anne, you have something? Uh, there? Yes, I think there is, uh, from uh, the University of Iowa, we do have a mental health uh, clinic where students can go and seek help. The only problem that there is is that, do they approach it from cultural perspective? Mm -hmm. uh, for if they are talking about, like, let's say they're talking about African-American, do all things that the, do African-Americans look at things the same way that an African from Africa looks at mental health? These are the discussions that I have in my classroom because me, when I talk about mental health in diverse society, what I've found out is that people look at mental health differently. While one person may, if you mention the word mental health, they be thinking of, oh my gosh, I'm you, this person is calling me crazy. And so to them, you have to be in a position where you have to explain to them what mental health is about. Are you stressed? You have to look uh, for alternative words to use. And I don't think um, we have enough resources to support all these students who come to the University of Iowa. But I do know that University of Iowa has a mental health uh, clinic where somebody can go and seek mental health. The only problem is, are they going to approach it in such a way that all those who visit the clinic will understand what's going on and will get the help they need? Yeah, thank you, ma'am. That's a really important point. Okay, we have another question. We have a sizable portion of our population in, in Iowa, which is not welcoming to non-white immigrants. We cannot simply ignore these individuals. How do we open their minds and hearts? Rocio, how do we do it? Um, I'm really thinking hard on that question only because it's, it's not something that can have been overnight. It's, it's a very long process to change someone's mind, right? And so, um, how do I say it? Um, definitely, I think 
I would say being aware, <laughs> I guess you could say like, I don't know, since I've, I've experienced it, right? Like I've experienced um, ignorance and all that um, stuff. And so honestly, like I've never really thought about it that way, like how I could like change their minds to not view me a certain, for people to not view me a certain way. Um, and so I haven't really like thought about that. <laughs> um how do we open their minds and hearts honestly i have no idea i've never thought about that <laughs> i have no idea I'll that's okay that. it's, it's oh, quite yeah. a challenge indeed but i i think yeah. part of what you're saying i'll extrapolate a little bit is that folks yeah. need more inter you know interactions encounters friendships experiences in the classroom, oh, yeah. out of the classroom yeah. with folks who are like and unlike themselves and learn from each other i mean it's harder to it's harder to, God, I don't know, I don't like the word hate at all, but it's harder to hate right. some when you know them, you know where they're from, what they're about, what they love, what they care about, because right. suddenly the world looks different to you and you see the world through the eyes of others. And kill yeah. them with kindness. Yeah. <laughs> kill them with <laughs> kindness. That yeah. works. Okay, Vin gave yeah. an example about reaching, uh, about reaching an apple. And I think one of the reasons why many immigrant students drop out is because of the category uh, they may be, uh, which uh, makes them disqualified. I had friends who had to pay the tuition out of pocket because they couldn't be uh, qualified by FAFSA based on their income, when in reality, they must work hard to feed their family or even do not know anyone as, uh, as, the, as a result of the drop. So what are other resources which can help them pursue higher education other than free English courses, uh, which is doing a great job. Uh, and this individual says, by the way, I'm an immigrant and graduated from Kirkwood Co Community College. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, congratulations. Yeah. Uh, what do we think? So what other uh, resources are, are available for those who are, are lacking the funds? Uh, Mallory, other places you can point uh, folks to? Yes, there are some really great places. So one organization, um, Dream Iowa, they have compiled a list of scholarships specifically for um, immigrants, um, especially they have several for students that are undocumented and may not otherwise be eligible for financial assistance. Additionally, there are quite a few grant programs that are um, that don't have the same income requirements as the FAFSA and the Pell Grant that are offered through um, Iowa Works or different um, like community colleges and schools. So those are specifically for um, careers that are in high demand. Um, for example, like nursing, um, some of the computer sciences, some business programs that those grants would be available to. Um, Peter, I can share those resources so they can be stored somewhere, um, but those grants, yes. scholarship opportunities, those can be great ways. Uh, I do quickly want to touch on the question that was asked by Peter just about creating more welcoming environments yeah. Um, so much of that I've seen in my career has been built off of misconceptions and a lack of education on how the system works. And just, um, you know, speaking from someone who has lived in Iowa their entire life, we have so much responsibility, those of us who have lived here our entire life, in my personal opinion, as a white person to confront those misconceptions and misunderstanding and to not only expect individuals who are newcomers to be providing that information you know our state is so much better because of the diversity and the welcoming environment that we're creating and so much of that rhetoric is built off of misinformation and built off of fear so just that education is so important yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to end us on that point because it could not be better said. Thank you very much, Mallory. I completely agree with you. Uh, I know we could go on much longer. This has been a fabulous conversation. Uh, I wish we had two, three, four, five hours. I think we could do it. We need to charge it with coffee. We can make it happen. Just not today, unfortunately. Uh, so that does conclude our program. I want to give a big thanks to Dr. Ann Keach, Vin Nguyen, Mallory Petch, and Rocio Lopez for sharing their expertise and time with us today. Uh, Ann, Vin, Mallory, Rocio, I am honored to virtually present 
Each of you with ICFRC's highly coveted mug or cup <laughs> or the beverage of your choice, and we'll coordinate delivery details with you very soon. I want to let you know that ICFRC's next program is on Friday, April 1st, featuring Dr. Monica Prasad from Northwestern University, who will talk on Can Social Science Help Solve Corruption? And our next program in the Refugee and Immigrant Series is on April 13th. That's only three weeks from now, three weeks, and we'll be focusing on writing and reading about the immigrant and refugee experience. <laughs> We have sent you an email about the books we recommend, right? We got some great books we'd like you to recommend. And I'm going to throw in one more for today. Uh, if you are an academic like me and don't get bored by, you know, the heavy text, uh, I'm going to definitely recommend this one. But do look out for, um, uh, for other books, The Displaced. Um, we've got We the Interwoven series. And we heard it when we were young by Chewy Renteria. Our guests next time will be Andrea Wilson, editor of the We the Interwoven series, and three authors, Chewy Renteria, Ayed Said, and Antonia Rivera. So thank you very much for joining us today, and uh, we are adjourned. Mm -hmm.